Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the MedSafety Exchange webinar series, a joint venture by the Institute for Safe Medi Medication Practices Canada and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded so that it's available to those who couldn't make it at this time, and the link to the recording will be available on the webpage one week from today. We have all the lines muted, and we encourage any questions or comments to be typed to us in the chat box, and then we'll read them out loud at the end of the webinar during the discussion period. So the purpose of this webinar series is to provide a platform whereby we can share and learn from one another to minimize the recurrence of med incidents and optimize med safety in all care sites. I'd like to tell you about a couple updates to our Med Safety Exchange website. So firstly, the materials and resources presented during the webinar that presenters are able to share can be accessed via links associated with the presentation title. So this is added at the time that the webinar recording link is added, so about a week from today. And again, we thank all organizations who are willing to share and we encourage all participants to learn from each other and further the work of medication safety. The second change is the Med Safety Exchange uh, has a new email address, so please send any comments, ideas, or follow-up to medsafetyexchange at ismpcanada.ca. So now for today's overview, every webinar will have roughly the same structure but with different content. So this time we have one med incident analysis regarding the technological gaps for patch removal and a description of a med safety initiative to standardize medication administration. This will be followed by the observatory for a med safety update and then finish up with a discussion period where we read out your comments and keep the learning going. So anonymity is still a choice for those involved in the webinar, so I'll only introduce speakers briefly and then they can choose to share as much or as little as they'd like about themselves or their practice site. I'd like to invite the first speaker to discuss an instant analysis about patch removal and some of the ways technology still needs to be optimized to help with this, particularly for non-standard dosing regimens. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Wu. I am a clinical pharmacist working at West Park Healthcare Center, a rehabilitation hospital. Today I will be presenting on a medication incident that involves technological gaps for electronic patch removal orders. So a nurse has brought to the pharmacist's attention of a patient's nicotine patch, which reads, apply Nicoderm 21 milligram patch transdermally at 8 a.m. and remove after 14 hours. The order lacked a patch removal order on the computerized physician order entry, CPOE, and the electronic medication administration record, the EMAR systems. The nicotine patch order was inconsistent with the other patches, such as the nitroglycerin patch that automatically generates a patch removal order on the CPOE and the EMAR. The outcome of this error led to no harm and is considered a near miss since the error did not reach the patient. There were several contributing factors for the medication incident that could have easily led to a medication error taking place. First of all, nurses did not have an automatic EMAR reminder to remove the nicotine patch for the patient and might forget to do so. The lack of an automatic reminder led to the nurses using workarounds that might have led to errors themselves. The day shift nurses were manually writing a reminder to remove the nicotine patch daily at 10 p.m. on the communication board in order to let the evening shift nurses know. However, the communication board is an erasable blackboard that contains many reminders, in which some may not be patient-specific. This can lead to nurses failing to notice the reminder on the board. Nursing shifts can often get busy and removal of patches can easily be overlooked. As well, non-standard nicotine patch removal time at 14 hours post-patch application was used in this medication order instead of the standard removal time of 24 hours post-patch application. The 24 hours removal timing for the patch order can almost act as its own reminder for nurses due to the continuation of the order, which the nurses remove the old patch before applying the new patch daily at 8 a.m. The use of a non-standard patch removal timing may throw off some nurses who are used to the standard removal timing and may not remember to remove the patch after 14 hours. Upon further analysis, it was found that only the nitroglycerin patch order had a patch removal 
order that is automatically generated when the patch application order is entered. It was also found that the fentanyl and scopolamine patches did not automatically generate a patch removal order on the CPOE and the EMAR similar to the nicotine patch orders. These are just some examples of how the patch orders used to look like on our EMAR system. The top of the slide shows the nicotine patch order, which only has a patch application order. This is compared to the nitroglycerin patch order on the bottom of the slide, which has both a patch application and the patch removal orders. This same uh, example can also be sh shown here, where the fentanyl patch order um, compared to the nitroglycerin patch order on the bottom of the slide, where the nitroglycerin patch um, has both the patch application and the patch removal orders. Multiple strategies were proposed or trialed in order to improve the system. However, some did not work out. One such proposed uh, strategy that was ruled out included pharmacists entering a separate patch removal order into the CPOE and EMAR for every patch application order. For our system, this would involve building a non-formulary patch removal order on, into the CPOE, which can be very time-consuming and prone to errors, so this strategy was not used. Another strategy that was trialed, though unfortunately did not work out, was an initial fix in creating a patch removal order to remove the nicotine patch five minutes prior its application time every 24 hours. The fix did not include other patch removal times, such as 12 hours or 14 hours post-application. In addition, the fix led to problems in which the patch removal order may be scheduled later than the time of the patch application order. For example, if the patch was applied at the default time at 8 a.m., then the next day's patch removal time would be scheduled at 7.55 a.m., so five minutes before the next patch is due. However, if the patch was applied late at a non-standard time such as 9 a.m., then this would push the next day's patch removal order to 8.55 a.m., Meanwhile, the next day's default application time still says 8 a.m. This may result in the previous day's patch not being removed before the next day's patch is applied. So this strategy was also ruled out. Strategies that did work out in improving the system included the following. The medication incident was reported to the pharmacy manager. The pharmacy manager consulted the CPOE and EMAR programmer, whom worked with the clinical pharmacist team in order to build an automatic nicotine patch removal order that was associated with both the standard and off-label times post-administration for patch application orders. In addition, the programmer helped standardize the automatic patch removal orders for other medications, such as fentanyl and scopolamine patches. Testing of the patch orders was completed by the programmer as well as the clinical pharmacist before the new versions of the patch orders were implemented or went live in the system. Here are some examples of how the patch orders look like on the EMAR system before and after the patch fix. The top shows the before and the bottom shows the after. You can clearly see that the nicotine patch order on the top had only the patch application order compared to the fixed nicotine patch order on the bottom, which now has both the patch application and the patch removal order. The example here shows a 14-hour patch removal timing. Uh, you can also see here the before and after for the fentanyl patch fix on the top and the bottom of the slide. And you can clearly see here that the improved fentanyl order now has both a patch application and patch removal orders. So I just wanted to go over some final lessons learned from this experience. First, communication, collaboration, and teamwork between the clinical healthcare team, including pharmacists, nurses, and the IT department, is essential to ensure a successful implementation of CPOE and EMAR changes. As well, there must be reasonable turnaround time for IT staff to implement changes to the CPOE and EMAR systems when requests are made. Requests should be prioritized in terms of urgency and how critical the change is needed to ensure patient safety. Lastly, testing of new changes made to the CPOE and EMAR system is vital in order to detect any errors before implementation. It is important to have everyday users of these systems, such as pharmacists and nurses, test out the system usability before going live with any changes. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me present on this medication incident and analysis on ways that technology can be optimized to improve electronic patch removal orders.
Great, thank you, Lisa. And thank you for walking us through that near miss and particularly the technological strategies to communicate that duration to nurses because it's quite error prone to rely solely on memory for how long each medicated patch should stay on, especially with off-label use and those different durations. So I'm glad that the uh, removal is now clearly communicated in the system as well. So I'd like to invite the second speaker to describe the med safety initiative at their site to standardize medication administration in response to med errors in that step of the med use process. Thank you, Ambika. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marie-Claude Poirier. I'm a clinical informatics specialist at uh, the Montfort. So to give you a little bit of context, Montfort is an academic hospital in Ottawa with approximately 2,000 employees and 289 acute care beds. Um, the project we're presenting you today originally started as my Lean Green Belt um, certification project. Um, the choice to work on medication errors actually came from what I knew of a true interest from uh, higher management in addressing this matter and the definite will to uh, find solutions to address and improve on the matter for some time now. Uh, personally, uh, having great interest in QI projects, especially addressing patient safety issues, I jumped on the opportunity that I, that I saw. So what we knew about the situation was that over 240 incidents related to the administration phase of the drug management process were reported annually at Montfort. We consider the, just as a reference, we consider the administration phase from the time from which uh, the drug is available to the nurse up until it's administered directly to the patient. For this project, we accounted for all the incidents reported as either a missed dose, the administration of a wrong dosage, the wrong medication, or to the wrong patient. These 240 incidents represent around 56% 56 56 of all medication errors being uh, reported. What we found was that from these incidents, 47% occurred on our medical surgical units, probably due, of course, to the high volumes of, uh, of medication administration on these units. And that if we looked a bit closer, we saw that our 5C surgical unit, um, it seemed like the annual numbers were a bit more consistent from year to year, so over time, making this unit very interesting to look at. So we decided to choose our 5C surgical unit um, to undergo a pilot project. We also wanted to establish a baseline for our pilot project nursing units, so we identified two different indicators to measure our baseline. First, the number of reported incidents on 5C on a monthly basis. We found an average of about 2.4 incidents reported monthly. And second, we decided to look at behaviors related to practice during the drug administration by our nurses on 5C. We had established a few key best practices that we wanted to look at to observe. And we, what we did observe initially, so in the pre-implementation phase of our project, was not necessarily very good as we found that in only 31% of um, the incidents of observations, we did see the best practice behavior um, by the nurse. Then we mapped out our actual medication administration process with a team of nurses from uh, 5C. Uh, when we look at this slide, I realize that the writing on the slide is very small, but what's most important to point out here is not necessarily the steps themselves of the process as much as the little red triangles throughout the process. These triangles were put there to identify every step where we found at least two or more ways of doing things. So what sticks out mostly from this slide is the lack of standardization that was identified in our nurses' practices. And as you can see, it's almost every step of the way. Having all this info on hand, it became clear that we needed to work toward optimizing the drug administration process if we wanted to reach, if, if we wanted to reach our ultimate goal of reducing the amount of medication errors 
um, and the goal was to reduce it by 20% by June 30th. In order to reach our goal, it had to pass by the standardization and the improvement of the medication administration practices. So from there, we did a root cause analysis with a fishbone exercise, and we asked ourselves, why do we make errors? Where do they come from? And from this root cause analysis, which I will pass today, um, emerged, of course, many solutions. Because we had a very enthusiastic team, uh, we ended up with multiple solutions on the table, um, but also because we were working on a lean project, we had to narrow down our solutions to the simplest and less expensive ones, of course. So we used a priority matrix to end up with the final solutions um, that the team wanted to implement. So they were the develop first the development of a standard work for our nurses, um, the improvement of the clarity of the information on our MARS, which are not yet electronic, um, the use of a medication transportation tool, and accompany everything with a training session to demonstrate and um, emphasize on best practice. So on this slide, you see the document representing our standard work. Um, now. It's written very small. I'm not going to go through the whole document with you, and it will be made available after the presentation. But basically what it does is it covers the step-by-step -step process, like following a recipe for, for and as to what every nurse should be doing to administer the meds. From, it passes from how meds should be prepared, transported to the bedside, presented to the patient, um, to the double identification of our patients, all the way to the administration and the supervision of the intake. Now, realizing that this document of our standard work could be very well forgotten over time, we wanted to find a way to have the standard work be part of the nurse's day. We wanted to have it handy and be part of our, working, uh, of our daily working tools. So what we did is we decided to print the standard work on, bind on binder dividers. These dividers are made of resistant plastic, and each one of them, as you can see on the picture, has a different number on it representing the, bed of the, the beds on the nursing unit. So these dividers are now used in each nurse's patient binder carrying the patient MARS. Each time a nurse opens her patient binder to consult or document the MAR. Um, she has the standard work handy. Um, so this kind of uh, tool became kind of the wow of the project and was very, very much appreciated by the whole, um, the whole team. Another solution that was implemented was to improve the clarity of the information presented on our patient SMARS. Um, the, so the content stayed exactly the same, but we reorganized the information on the MAR to make it easier to read and to decrease the risk of confusion. We listened to the nurses' needs on what uh, they wanted to see and in which order they wanted to see it, um, just to make it a little bit more intuitive. So that's an example of a very small change, but that did make a good difference in the nurse's work. The third solution that was implemented or introduced was a medication basket that was very much appreciated um, as the standard work had brought more medication preparation to the, ba to the patient's bedside. Um, so nurses needed a transportation tool for all the appropriate material that they were bringing. And last but not least, a training session was also developed as part of the solutions to ensure the proper understanding and adherence and compliance to the new standard work that was proposed. The session was built as a 15-minute huddle where we discussed medication errors and what could be done to prevent them. The presentation of the standard work in writing also was done, but the success of the training session was the, th the three minutes video that we produced uh, that we produced to demonstrate the standard work through illustrating it step by step. Um, and you are more than welcome to click on the link once you get the information after today's session. As 
for preliminary results of our project, when we look at the number of reporting incidents, reported incidents, we see that since implementation last April, we have only um, two months and a half worth of data. So unlike we have hoped in the beginning, it seems like it's a, it's a bit it's still a bit too early since implementation to observe a true decrease in the number of related incidents. Due to process and reporting awareness that was created and increased by adherence to the initiative, we now believe that an increase in reported incidents is also possible before we observe um, an improvement. However, the most satisfying result so far is the significant improvement that you can see on the slide here in the observation of best practices uh, for uh, medication administration by our nurses. As we can see, the percentage of observed best practice climbed from 31% in the pre-implementation phase all the way up to 78% in the post-implementation phase. So what's next? Actually, um, our project has generated a lot of interest across the hospital, and we're presently developing an implementation guide to allow the expansion of the standardized process across all of our use nursing units. Um, we have also established a working group, the initial working group actually, as being a permanent working group now to allow further improvements and support for further development and implementation. But it's been a pleasure to share our project with you today. I will be happy to share the presentation um, or answer any questions you have during the question period. And also, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions regarding our project. Um, I leave my contact information in the presentation. And I also watch. I also invite you uh, to watch our training video um, that was produced. Um, with this initiative. Um, it's a great way of seeing how uh, the process works now at Montfort and is standardized. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for presenting your project to standardize medication administration and address that error-prone error process. And for our listeners, whether your site is paper-based or computerized, there are some uh, transferable recommendations here that can help reduce uh, errors during medication administration. And as I mentioned earlier, the website will be updated in a week or so, so with the recording link as well as the resources shared today. So this will be the document with the standardized process and the link to the training video. So we'll now get into the observatory for some quick med safety updates. I'll ask Health Canada to give us an update on the plain language labeling initiative. And I am with the patient safety section of Health Canada, and I am also a pharmacist. A July 2006 National Academy of Medicine report stated that names, labels, and packages were a leading cause of medication errors and injury, including fatalities. The FDA has also declared that almost half of the error reports received by their MedWatch program are related to product names, labels, and packages. So clearly, these elements are a key consideration when we look at factors that influence the safe use of health products. Health Canada is responsible for approving brand names, packages, and labels submitted by the pharmaceutical industry. We are responsible for medication incidents that may arise from these elements, while practice or systems issues are the jurisdiction of provincial and territorial regulatory bodies. In recognizing the role that medication errors play in contributing to patient harm, it became apparent to Health Canada that our regulatory review of health product names, packages, and labels did not always translate optimally into how products are used in the healthcare environment. For example, the guidance on labeling tells industry that parenterals should display the total drug in the vial, the milligram per mil concentration, and the volume. 
but it does not provide guidance on how to organize this information on the label so that these figures are not confused with each other, which is something that we have seen in error reports. So to help address this regulatory gap, Health Canada developed the Plain Language Labeling Initiative, which focuses on making names, packages, and labels easier to read and understand. This initiative has three goals. To reduce preventable medication incidents, to improve the safe and effective use of drugs, and to support Canadians in making informed choices about drugs. The Plain Language Labeling Initiative has been in effect since June 2015 for prescription products. Two years later, in June 2017, we began implementation for non-prescription products, and we are now drafting regulations to expand this initiative to natural health products. What does plain language labeling mean for our review processes and for what we require from the pharmaceutical industry? Firstly, under the plain language component of this initiative, it enables Health Canada to require that product labels be clear, accurate, and easily understandable for the end user. We require that the format of the label as well as any graphics or symbols used, do not cause confusion. Mock-ups of labels and packages must now also be submitted by industry so that our reviewers can assess the product label as an accurate representation of what will be available to the health professional or patient after product approval. Prior to this initiative, you may be surprised to hear that companies did not have to submit an actual label to Health Canada for approval before marketing their products. We would typically receive a Word document that listed what text would be on the label, but we would not see what color, graphics, font size, or style would ultimately be part of the final label. In reality, we had very little idea of what the final label would look like. So under plain language labeling, we can now also ask for a comprehensive assessment that provides evidence that brand names will not be confused with other health products on the Canadian market, which we refer to as a look-alike, sound-alike assessment. And we can also screen for naming practices that have been associated in the past with errors. For non-prescription drugs, we ask for a drug facts table that uses a standardized format for information such as active ingredients, directions for use, and warnings. These products must also display contact information in order to report problems or complaints. To support the plain language requirement of this initiative, that the presentation of the labels does not impede user comprehension we developed in collaboration with the ISMP Canada two guides for the pharmaceutical industry that provide direction in designing safe and clear labels and packages. These two guides are called the Good Label and Package Practices Guides. One covers prescription drugs and the other over-the-counter medications. During the development of these documents, a lot of evidence was collected on label and package issues that contribute to medication errors. This list presents some of the concerns identified from that review that are addressed by specific recommendations in the guides. And there are two links on this slide that will bring you to the Good Label and Package Practices guides, both for prescription and non-prescription products on our website. Here I have an example of a label that met Health Canada's regulatory requirements, but improvements were needed in terms of label design in order to promote patient safety. Here on the label, we, we see three different expressions of strength on the main panel. Just under the brand name, Cerebix, we have phosphenitoin as 75 milligrams per mil in small black font. 
Then in the middle of the label, phenytoin as total milligram per total volume, i.e. 500 milligrams per 10 mil, and again on the same line as 50 milligram per mil. We also see the volume of 10 mil listed in fairly close proximity in the same color, the blue text, below the expression of strength. The text is crowded together in a dense block and it may be difficult for the user to focus on the key elements. In addition to the crowding of information, we also see that the corporate logo, IRFA, is very prominent and takes up a lot of space on the label. So we worked with the sponsor to redesign the label using the design recommendations outlined in the Good Label and Package Practices Guide. You can see that the total amount of drug in the vial, the 500 milligram per 10 mil, now appears in large blue font surrounded by white space to make it the most prominent expression of strength on the label. The per mil concentration is on a separate line below in smaller black font. And the 75 milligram per mil strength has been moved from the main panel to the side since the phosphenotone portion is not part of dosing calculations. The 10 mil volume is now underneath the logo so that it cannot be confused with the expressions of strength. And the size of the logo has been reduced. The font size of the information on the side panel has been reduced so that the information can be displayed in a standard orientation rather than sideways. By reorganizing the information, there is now more space on the main panel and readability is improved. The eye is drawn to the key piece of information in the center of the label, which is the total amount of drug in the vial. And in summary, I would just like to note that a recent ISMP Canada bulletin stated that there have been improvements in medication labeling and packaging following the release of the Good Label and Package Practices Guides under Health Canada's Plain Language Labeling Initiative. And thank you for your interest. Great, thank you, Sally. And yes, I can definitely say from ISMP Canada's perspective, labeling and packaging is an important contributing factor uh, to med incidents. So it's, it's good to know that there are strides being taken to minimize that. I'll now ask CPSI to give us an update on an important med safety initiative. Yes, I today. Uh, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to begin promoting Canadian Patient Safety Week, uh, which is our annual week-long campaign. Uh, medication safety is uh, the uh, topic area again this week, uh, and this year our campaign runs from October 28th to November the 2nd. Our theme is Not All Meds Get Along, and we're highlighting the risks of multiple medications uh, and encouraging at-risk populations and groups to obtain a medication review from uh, their pharmacist, physician, nurse, or prescriber, uh, particu particularly in, um, in, er in people uh, taking five or more medications, uh, patients who have been recently discharged from hospitals or other health facilities, uh, or patients or families just simply concerned um, about side effects that you are experiencing or you are seeing in your loved ones. Um, so uh, as in past years, this year's campaign will include uh, a webinar, um, some quizzes, new podcasts, which were uh, immensely popular last year, uh, and some new tools and resources to help you um, have these conversations with your patients and promote these conversations uh, with prescribers. Um, sign up today. Uh, sign up is free and it's online at asklistentalk.ca and visit our website to learn more about how you can get involved. Thanks everybody. Back to you, Mika. Great, thank you, Steve. I'm looking forward to that uh, Patient Safety Week. So, we appreciate all the great information shared today by our speakers, and we'll now turn, turn our attention to the questions that we've received throughout the webinar, and then we'll have our pre presenters elaborate. 
thanks very much, uh, Ambika, and thank you to all the presenters. Uh, it's Mike Hamilton here, and I'll moderate the uh, question and uh, comment section. Uh, we've had lots of uh, questions from the audience, and, and we really appreciate this. Uh, it uh, it uh, makes for a very engaging uh, conversation. I'll start off uh, with uh, uh, directing towards Lisa um, with the, uh, the the patch initiative. And this will start off with a two-part question. Um, the first part is what CPOE system or what EMR system or software system are you using? And the second part is how flexible is that uh, patch removal program or the system set up to other types of patches? And the questioner gives some examples like rivastigmine patches daily, uh, bupropion patches can be up to one week, um, certain contraceptive patches are on for three weeks and then off for, for a week. Um, can the system you develop or can the process you develop accommodate all these different types of patches? Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike, for the, um, asking me the questions. Um, our hospital uses the CPOE uh, known as EPR, uh, it's formerly known as uh, Harris or QuadraMed. And um, our system doesn't really have a very flexible patch removal order. Um, the, so the way that uh, the order has to be built would have to go through our programmer um, who specializes in building like each of the timing and the standard both off-label timing for each of the medication. Uh, so for bupropion as well as rivastigmine patches, they would, those medications would be considered non-formulary in our hospital and uh, for those patches um, that would have to be entered as a non-formulary entry and as well the patch removal order would have to be a non-formulary patch removal order as well. Um, thank you, Lisa. And I, I'll follow up with a related question um, from uh, uh, someone at a different facility. Um, and they say, in our MAR, the displays are in alphabetical order based on time. And they give the example uh, for 0800 MAR administration time, the fentanyl patch administration, which begins with an F for fentanyl, would be separated from the remove previous fentanyl patch, which begins with an R, by a number of other medications mixed in there, like linagliptin with L and morphine with M and perindopril with P. And their question is that our, their concern is that this direction may be missed or forgotten if it's separated by a number of different medicines. Um, how important is it, do you think, that these um, two instructions to uh, administer patch and remove patch are linked together in some way, either uh, by proximity or in some other fashion? I think it's quite important that the two orders are linked together so the nurses do not miss the removal order and it can, they can associate the removal order with the application order. Um, so I think in, in that uh, specific case, it might be um, useful to contact the programmer and to help address this issue at their center. Um, at our center um, uh, and the program that we use, EPR, it does link the, two rem uh, the patch application removal order together for the patches. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and we'll finish off uh, with one more question for you, um, and I, I think it's an interesting one about how you actually um, decided um, what strategies are not going to work or what strategies are going to work. And the question is, you rightly state that testing prior to implementation is critical, and can you describe the, uh, how you actually went about testing? Uh, what, steps, uh, what steps did you take? Yeah. Um, so after um, the uh, pharmacy manager was notified of the medication incident, um, we consulted um, the EPR and the EMAR uh, programmer. So uh, that was very uh, that was a vital step in terms of initiating the change. Um, after that, um, the programmer would email the clinical pharmacist team with proposed changes, and um, if there's any. Uh, dis, um, discrepancies or we didn't understand certain points, we would have um, a meeting in person to discuss those changes. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, there would be an agreement on, uh, on a certain change after the pharmacist can test those changes kind of in person with the programmer. And uh, once that's all finished, um, we 
the programmer would uh, select the the change that uh, the the programmer can go live with the system. Up with one question that just got presented to us um, from uh, a practitioner: Our process for removal is to have another staff member witness removal and co-sign before the application. And is there an ability on your EMAR to include a co-signature? Uh, on our EMAR, we usually just have one nurse sign off that they remove the patch um, for the. Uh, narcotic patches, I would imagine there would be two nurses, but um, I'll have to get back to you on that question. Uh, th thanks so much, Lisa. Um, our next set of questions will be directed towards uh, Maddie Claude. Uh, th thank you uh, again from the Montfort for, uh, for presenting. Um, our first question is what specific uh, administration errors uh, did you uncover when you were doing your initial analysis? and, and do you have a sense of if any of them have been rectified or ameliorated uh, by your uh, strategies? Um, yes, actually what we did use in terms, because we wanted to narrow down the errors that were really related to the administration process, we decided to choose four different problems that were um, categorized in our, in our reporting system, and those were errors for a missed dosage, a wrong dosage, a missed dose actually, a wrong dosage, wrong medication administered, or a medication administered to the wrong patient. So we're only looking at those four, uh, four problems in our incident. And basically, uh, as, as we could see in the graph that I presented, um, it's a bit too early to see some significant changes right now because we, we've implemented in April, uh, actually mid-April, and we only have two and a half months worth of data right now. So it's a bit, we, we, we initially wanted to see results right away, but we, we realized that we were maybe ambitious, a little bit too ambitious to see the results right away. Observation, I'll follow that up with that, I think is a very interesting question. Um, can you elaborate on the process you followed for observing the best practices when administering medications? Um, the questionnaire has been asked in their own facility to observe the process, and uh, she finds that since the staff are aware they're being observed, they often will change their behavior or become hypervigilant. Yes. Um, I have to admit that we tried to be a little bit sneaky. <laughs> Um, so what we did is, is we did um, have two observers on the floor. One observer is the actual regular uh, nurse educator who is very much um, on the floor all the time, in the room, so it was kind of normal to see her around. So she tried to make it not so obvious that she was observing her colleagues. And the other observer is also a clinical expert on the floor, um, and she she did she did admit that it was uh, sometimes very difficult. But she was using strategies like just being um, preparing her own uh, medication or just pretending she was preparing medication just as she was observing her colleagues um, across the hall or in a room and listening to what they were doing and. and and uh, saying to the patient. So we did have to uh, um, use a little bit uh, of a few kind of strategies to be a bit sneaky because it is, it's true, it is a hard thing to do. Um, your standard work document, your standard work for administration document seems very thorough and clear. And the questioner wonders, um, what resources did you use to develop this, or how did you incorporate all the best practices that you could find out there into the development of this, of this recipe that you call? Uh -huh. um, actually, what we did use is, um, first of all, I want to say that the policies and procedures that are related to drug administration at Montfort um, are already uh, um, written and built with uh, the best practices that we find in the literature. So um, we used, we have, I think I have a list of 
four, actually, yeah, four policies and procedures that um, come from MOFA, but again, that are based on best practices that are found in the literature. And also the other resource, which I can share definitely if someone would be interested in, in seeing. And also um, the, prof the professional standards from RNAO for drug administration. And so related to that, um, the next question is, you certainly made improvements in your pre-implementation and post-implementation best practice observations, are these both based on that same standard work document? And a follow-up question to that would be, how often going forward are you going to perform this observation practice? Mm -hmm. um, to answer the first question, so the answer is yes. Um, the observation um, uh, document and uh, the the key steps that we chose to observe are based on the standard work document, the best practices that we inc incorporated in the standard work document. Um, and we have decided to do regular observation or audits um, on, a, on a, a quarterly basis for the first year. So starting um, the pre-implementation observation was done, I think, in January or February of this year. Um, the first post-implementation observation was just finished in June. And so three months from now, so in September, so on a quarterly basis, it will be done four times. And then we'll re re reassess to see if we still need to go as regularly as quarterly or as if we can go maybe biannually or something. Once we really understand and, and really observe that the process is, is really um, encrusted in the nurse's practice. And, and one final question for you, Mary Claude. Um, a question asking: Do these preliminary results of the safety events are you able to differentiate near misses from errors that actually reach the patient? Uh, we are able to um, differentiate near misses uh, from incidents, uh, but you know what? I think what I did is I we did include everything, and in, I'd have to go back. I, in, by memory, I'm, I don't remember if I did include near misses, but I think I did. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Mary Claude. And we'll turn our attention to uh, uh, Sally uh, Pepper from Health Canada, and we have uh, a few questions for, for Sally. Um, first one is, does the Plain Language Initiative extend to consumer umbrella brands or brand extensions? And this person is a community pharmacist, and he or she finds that consumers get very confused with umbrella products like Tylenol sinus, Tylenol cold and sinus, Tylenol flu, Tylenol cough, and he's concerned there's a risk of acetaminophen and other drug overdose with these types of brands and feels that perhaps a plain language initiative might be helpful in this case. Thanks, Mike. Well, we do have a detailed uh, we have a detailed and robust uh, set of criteria in place for the review of prescription product brand names, and we are working on a framework to cover non-prescription products. You know, I, I would have to say that we recognize that umbrella branding, particularly when the active ingredient is no longer present in the extension product, uh, that these products can be confusing and, and frankly sometimes are even misleading for consumers. Uh, we are hopeful that the drug facts table should help to make the active ingredient and the uses for non-prescription products more clear to consumers when they're selecting or choosing between products. Uh, the drug facts table is, is going to go through a, a phased implementation. So we are implementing it now for new submissions. And by 2021, uh, the expectation is that all products uh, that are covered under the scope on a pharmacy shelf for self-selection should have a facts table um, on the outer label. But uh, I'd like to say we are always interested in reports or any examples that are problematic, such as this Tylenol line of products. And we would encourage pharmacists and other health professionals and consumers as well, actually, to report these examples or these problems or if they've resulted in um, errors to our pharmacovigilance program, the Canada Vigilance Program, which is um, you can report through a variety of means, including through our website, through online reporting or through a, a phone call. 
So that's what I would certainly encourage, and that does help us at our end when we're developing these kind of uh, tools or these sort of frameworks for name review. It does help us to have examples where things have proved uh, problematic. So yes, we are in the process of developing uh, something to address the naming of non-prescription products. And a second question, Sally, related to this one. Um, what sort of uh, input does Health Canada get from patients and families with respect to the mock-ups of labels and packages and, and as you mentioned, the drug facts table? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say for, for mock-ups of packages and labels, because this information is submitted by sponsors prior to product approval, uh, it is considered proprietary information, but from what I understand, other agencies such as the EMA are developing processes to pull patients in more adequately into the review process despite these challenges of dealing with information that is um, proprietary, that is actually the company's domain. So that is, that is a challenge, but there is work that can be done in that area, um, certainly for the, the Drug facts table, we have involved patients and uh, patient safety organizations and consumer groups in the uh, development of the drug facts table at various points throughout this process. And in fact, we had a couple of technical sessions with industry over the last month, couple of months and uh, presentations by uh, consumer groups and patients were a key part of that, uh, of, of that um, development of those sessions. So uh, yes, there is scope to include patients, and, and we can do more work in this area. Um, and thanks. I, I, oh, sorry, Mike. I should also point out that uh, sometimes we'll go back to the sponsor and ask them specifically to do user testing on a product if we feel that this would help the development of the package or label. We, we can request that as well. Uh, thank you so much, Sally, and thank you to everyone who submitted a whole flood of questions, and we apologize to those we couldn't get to, but hopefully we'll, uh, we'll find answers uh, down the road uh, to them. And I'll turn them over to uh, Ambika right now for our closing. Great. Thank you again to all our speakers and the participants for their questions and participation. Um, so we do want to, we want everyone to be part of the Med Safety Exchange. So if it's an incident analysis or a Med Safety Initiative, please email us to share the learning. And please don't forget to fill out the poll that's uh, available at the bottom of your screen. Um, the same questions will be asked in an email to those who registered. So whichever is most convenient for you to complete. And again, the link to the recording of this webinar will be available on the uh, Med Safety Exchange website next week, along with any resources that were provided by the presenters. And registration for the next webinar on Wednesday, September 26th is now open, so you can head over to the website to sign up. Thank you again to our speakers for the important analyses and strategies shared today, and to the participants for, for joining the discussion and sharing the learning. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you again in two months. Bye for now.